Well, Church of the Highlands is a Christ-centered, Bible-teaching church, assisting people to know and love Christ Jesus through a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission. That's what we're about. That's what we've been about for more than 60 years. The church was founded by my dad. He went to see the Lord on 2016. I'm sure there was a great celebration for that. But the work continues. And my mom is still alive and doing well. She's 91. And uh, she founded our school. Yeah. <laughs> she founded our school over 50 years ago. So it's a, a unique opportunity to uh, experience things that are not, don't oftentimes happen in ministry, such as having some of the children of some of the children that were in our school in our school. And handling the second generation, I wouldn't imagine that it, we might have some third generation uh, coming up shortly. And then uh, also, uh, I had a lady come up to me and introduce herself this morning as the great-granddaughter of one of our pastors many years ago when I was a young person in our church. So uh, we, we really get, have a, a special opportunity to enjoy that. Um, we've been on radio ministry as a church for over 30 years on KFAX. It's my dad's voice that you hear uh, at uh, weekday mornings at about 6.30 in the morning. Uh, I was on right behind him for a while, but they had somebody else who had more money than we did to buy that spot, and they put me sometime in the, in the evening. But for several years, I had the opportunity to, to minister in the morning. I'm still on in the morning on KDIA, and that's actually uh, where we started. But uh, you folks may have heard of Craig Roberts. He's been associated with KFAX for, uh, I think, 30, almost 30 years now. Um, Craig Roberts is the voice of Lifeline, the talk show in the afternoon. Uh, he's a dear friend of mine. In fact, I have known him since be before becoming a grandpa, uh, before becoming a daddy, before becoming married. Uh, we go back to like when I was 16 or 17, and he was about the same. And uh, he was here for a special event in our church right up there. And it was in this church that he received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And God has gone on to bless him to minister to uh, many, many people over the time. So we're very, very thankful for that uh, relationship. Um, the radio ministry, I'm told, the, uh, I talked with uh, our Mike Trout, the editor, and, and we're going through the book of John, the Gospel of John on the radio, and he wants to do that from the beginning to the end. Uh, but in our sanctuary and on our website, we've been going through the book of Genesis, um, and we're doing that for a very good reason. We believe that Jesus Christ is coming again very soon. We think that there's all kinds of indications. Uh, he said no one knows the day or the hour. We don't set dates and things like that, but then he goes on to say you will know the season. Let me tell you about the season. He talks about earthquakes and and so on and so forth. And so we believe that Jesus Christ is coming again very soon. So we've addressed some of the issues related to that, some of the prophecies that the Bible tells us are indications of his return. It occurs to me that people need to know uh, how, why, how things are the, the way they are. Uh, how do, where do we start and, and where are we going and so forth? And of course, the place to, to learn that is from the book of Genesis, because it's the one that sets all of the foundations of understanding that follow. And uh, in starting in Genesis, uh, the first five words are, in the beginning, God created. And evolution is intended to contradict that claim, the first five words of the Bible, because the goal is, if you can question the first five words of the Bible, you can question any of the words thereafter as the word of God. And so uh, we address that uh, in, in Genesis, but there's also other things taking place. You all know that we're in some major shifts culturally. And so uh, the second uh, portion of the series dealt with uh, the creation of mankind. Uh, that there are two genders, male and female. For those who believe in God and believe in the Bible, there's no confusion. Because we don't choose our gender, God made them male and female goes on in chapter 2 to talk about distinct roles for males and females, and then it goes on to talk about marriage. One man, one woman, one flesh, one lifetime. And so we're going through Genesis in order to provide Christians the foundations of understanding how distinct Christianity is from the culture around them. 
And so we, why it's important for people to make a choice. Do you believe the Bible or do you believe the stuff that's going on around you? And uh, so we're making our way through the book of Genesis and uh, just wanted to, to let you know uh, to keep us in prayer as we continue that. And uh, this event uh, was scheduled, I think, six months ago or more. We've been working on it. And that was a time, remember, that when churches were opening and closing and opening and closing and stuff like that. So it was uh, an act of faith to do it both on our part and on their part. And, uh, and we are so glad that it's come together. And uh, Dr. Thomas was actually with us, I'm told, about eight years ago. So it's been eight years since ICR was here, and I told him, hey, we've got to make sure that you come back before another eight years happens. So hopefully we can make that happen. But let's pray right now, shall we, for our day? Lord, we are so thankful that we can gather together and that we can be encouraged in our walk of faith that we can be encouraged that your word is true and we, and we can put our faith in it and we can have answers to people who ask us the reason for the faith we have. We ask you, Lord, to bless this day, bless our speaker, bless our ears, bless our hearts. May they be toward you, we pray. In Jesus' name, um, let's welcome our speaker. Thank you, Pastor, and thanks for coming today. Great to see everybody, and it's an honor to return uh, after eight years. Wow. I have a few anecdotes from that time. It's fun memories. I had actually, I don't know if you know this, Jeff, but I received one of the highest compliments I've ever received. Uh, when I spoke uh, here, there's like a little school, and there was a little bunch of little kids, and they said, you're going to speak at the school. And I said, okay. And they brought in like, 500 five-year-olds, and they're, they're in this room, and I'm like, uh, and they're just starting to bounce off the seats, and I thought, I thought, okay, gearing down, you know, so I got to use, like, small words and, uh, and tell stories, so I switched into storytelling mode, and it worked out, and then, the, you know, I, I, I caught eye contact with one of the teachers, and I was like, are you going to help corral this mess, and, and they were like, good luck, bucko, you know. <laughs> So uh, story mode, and then I was like, and it, it worked out, you know, and, and uh, we had fun, and then the teachers kept their classes in here a little longer. They lingered a little bit, and they, you know, they got to ask questions and things about dinosaurs and whatnot, and we'll be speaking about dinosaurs this afternoon a little bit. Well, I'm in the parking lot right here, eight years ago, and one of those five-year-olds five year sees me, recognizes me, and you could, his face sort of lit up, and I was like, oh, he's going to say something, and he goes... You! And I said, hey, you talk good. <laughs> Three beautiful words. <laughs> Monosyllabic, nonetheless. It's great. You talk good. I've never forgotten that. And I hope that today I will talk good also. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. So now another. Another uh, fun memory is uh, we had this at the stage up. We had like the high schoolers were up doing uh, doing uh, worship music and and for that event here. And uh, you know, let me advance the slide. That's what I'm going to be talking about. Probably the best the best music I've heard. Probably the best worship. I mean, this high school kid. I, you might be here today and no longer in high school, obviously, but. He was jamming on the guitar, and he was singing this super cool song, and it, was, uh, it had something to do with, uh, you make beautiful things, talking to the Lord, you make beautiful things out of dust, and then he goes up an octave, you make beautiful things, you make beautiful things out of us. And I, and I, I heard that song for about two or three times during the, the time I was here, and I, and I went back home, and I thought, I've got to look up this song. I looked up the music video, it was fantastic. And it was a song by a band named Gunger, uh, I guess that's how you pronounce it, named after the guy's last name, Michael Gunger and his wife, and they have a band. Uh, and, then, um, and then he hit the news. Gunger hit the news uh, not, not a few months after, because that song, it's like you make beautiful things out of dust that seems to be a reference to God making Adam out of dust, the miracle of creation of the first man, Adam, out of dust. But Gunger went in the news and said, no, that's not what I meant. It's just a metaphor. Genesis is just a myth. 
And so he started to express doubts about Genesis and about the Bible. And, and I thought, oh, no. And then he got some of his gigs canceled. You know, the Baptist churches were like, you're not coming here anymore. Uh, and so, that, so there went that. And I thought, oh, boy. And so, so then he made the news. Um, and I wrote a news article about it. I uh, pulled it up here on icr.org um, as a news writer. Uh, we've got thousands of news articles that cover all kinds of topics. Gunger said this um, on a blog post reposted in a Christian magazine called The Christian Post. He said, Do I believe that Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness? Yes. Do I believe God literally drowned every living creature 5,000 years ago in a global flood except the ones that were living in a big boat? No, I don't. Why don't I? Because of science and rational thought. That's why I'm here today. Because we have Christians who say they believe, they say with, with one side of their mouth, I believe that the scripture is God breathed. But then they go and say, well, I don't believe what it says about the flood. Genesis is a joke, the flood never happened. By the way, if it's God-breathed, then you've got to trust it. <laughs> that's what God-breathed means. It means God wrote it, and it's correct because God cannot err because that's what God is, who God is. So he's saying one thing and believing another. He's saying he believes one thing. He's saying he believes, but he doesn't. So that's me. That was me. I would have agreed with this guy. I would have said um, not long ago, thank you. He's got to check me in for my flight. We're already late checking in. Tomorrow, so thank you, Corey. Um, anyway, so I would have believed, I, I would have said the same things. I agreed with him. Um, Genesis, meh. It's stories, it's myths, but God got my attention. And all I get to do today for the next half hour is share with you the story of how I went from evolution to creation through uh, these five discoveries. So five discoveries that led me from evolution to creation and led me from a low view of Genesis, where Genesis is a joke, to a high view of Genesis where, wow, the events recorded actually happened? And so this is my story on that. It started off with, um, with a, an opportunity while I was on the, the campus at Stephen F. Austin. I was going to school, working on an undergraduate degree in biology, and uh, I had come into contact with um, with a guy on the street, and he saw me skateboarding, and um, and he said, "Hey, man, what are you doing?" And I was like, "Oh, it's obvious, I'm skateboarding." And uh, and he had his hand behind his back, and and he had a group of of, of guys and gals with him, and and said, "Do you go to church? What do you believe about Jesus?" And I said, "Well, I I don't go to church, but I think Jesus, you know, I have a high regard for Jesus or whatever." So. The conversation went down something like that, and he said, well, if you're a Christian, you should, I mean, do you witness? I said, witness? Is there a court of law somewhere? What do you mean, witness? And he said, well, witness means to share with others what the Lord Jesus has done for you. So I was like, okay, I want to find out what this is about. And so he, he brought his Bible from around his back, and that's what he was holding back there. And he said, oh, okay, you're one of those Bible-carrying Christians. And so I just, I, I picked up my skateboard and followed Kurt is his name, and uh, actually had lunch with him yesterday in Dallas. Uh, sorry, day before yesterday. Uh, he's, he's from Houston, but I met him. So it's, after all these years, it's so good to know uh, uh, the folks who totally influenced your life and asked you the right questions and persisted in asking those questions, which is what happened to me, and led me to this, um, this concept of circular reasoning, circular reasoning. And so here's how it went down. So I'm following with Kurt, and Kurt took me to, uh, to teach me how to witness. So we got to practice this. So we went out in front of a bar, and there's a bar, and then there's people going in and out of the bar, and then there's this street. And I remember it was a brick wall um, at, at Crossroads Bar. It's long extinct. But um, we were there, and, uh, and Kurt started sharing with, you know, talking in conversation with, a, with um, some gal, and she was like, uh, she was holding her beer in one hand, and then Kurt was talking with her. What do you think about church? What do you think about Jesus? Trying to steer the conversation to spiritual things. And, um, and then she, she takes her drink and goes, oh, yeah, God is totally cool. Like, she hides it behind her back. So, 
God is awesome. Yeah, I, I, go to, I, I used to go to church, I, I believe, but, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. And, and then from the, my right side, and I'm kind of like a fly on the brick wall, you know, watching what's going on. This guy stumbles out of the bar, and he has had way too many drinks. And, um, and he is bombastic, and he is so loud, we can hear him up and down the street. You're talking about God and the Bible? Bible's a bunch of junk, man. And then so Kurt can no longer talk with this gal because this guy's just too, too much. And so he, he turns his attention to this guy and says, what about the Bible makes it such a piece of junk? And he goes, science, science has proved the Bible wrong. Talking like that. What science? And I was like, wow, this guy has, asks good questions. What science has proved the Bible wrong? Man, fossils. Fossils are millions of years old, and that's not in the Bible. <laughs> and I'm leaning against the brick wall thinking, the drunk guy's winning. <laughs> you know, he's right. Because the fossils aren't in the Bible. The millions of years aren't in the Bible. The, the evolution that those fossils prove isn't in the Bible. Because in the Bible, it says that God created these creatures to reproduce according to their kinds, but my biology teacher who knows better than God because he was there. Wait, who was there? <laughs> I trusted my biology teacher more. And my biology teacher said evolution. Morphing between kinds in direct contradiction to what God said about according to kinds. And then the Bible says within six days. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. That's in the Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God. Exodus 20, verse 11, and, and uh, that's not what evolution teaches. It's over billions of years, and so it's not, it's not thousands, it's millions, and completely different histories, and I thought, this guy's winning, because he's got the right, the scientific history, and then Kurt asked him this, you say the fossils are millions of years old, and that's why you don't believe the Bible, do you know how they assign ages to the fossils? And I mean, everyone in the street is like watching this conversation. And uh, the guy goes, man, they use science to assign ages to the fossils. Do you know what science they use? Like what experiment do they run that gives an age? And then the, the guy was, man, they use scientific science. He waved his hand, walked away, never seen him since. And, uh, and as I've said before, if he's here tonight, he probably wouldn't remember it anyway, so I can make up whatever I want to say. <laughs> so so, uh, so that happened. And, and so then we went back to Kurt's apartment afterwards, and Kurt said, hey, what do you think of that conversation? And I was like, yeah, that was pretty good, but the guy was right, you know, about millions of years and fossils and, and evolution. And, and, and Kurt said... Well, do you know how they assign ages to the fossils? Did you know that they assign an age to this fossil based on the age assignment of the rock layer from which they found the fossil? And that other scientists come by and assign an age to the rock layer based on the evolutionary age assignment to the, of the fossil that's in it. And did you know that they date the fossils by the rocks and the rocks by the fossils? And that's just circular reasoning, not science. And I thought, surely my professors aren't that dumb surely they're smarter than that. And he said, prove it to me. Show me that they're not using circular reasoning, and I won't tell people this anymore. And so I started researching. That was the key. That was the challenge he put before me that started me to think, all right, you're on. I'll figure this out, and I'll show that they actually measure stuff and that they're not using just circular reasoning. Well, a week passed. Brian, did you uh, refute circular reasoning? as the basis for this whole evolutionary scheme. And, and no, I haven't yet. I had to study for my uh, such and such test. A week later, same question. Well, Brian, do you still believe in that stuff? Or, or can you refute circular reasoning, that they use circular reasoning? Do they still date the it, fossils by the rocks and rocks by the fossils? No, I, well, I, I, I don't think they do. But, well, Brian, I'm waiting for you to refute me. And I'm, I'm waiting for the answer to this. I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer. Six weeks in a row, this guy persisted. And I got annoyed. I was like, 
So literally, he goes, well, let me bring this up again, Brian. And, you know, and uh, do they use circular reasoning? And I said, Kurt, I'm sick and tired of you asking me about circular reasoning. I don't want to talk about it anymore. And he goes, well, I love you too much to not talk about it because it's important that you understand where you came from. And he said, I'll, do you, I'll do you, uh, 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 make a deal with you. You read this creation book, and I'll stop asking you. If you'll just read this book about creation, I'll stop asking you. And I said, you know what? You're on. And uh, so I started reading this book on creation. It was titled Scientific Creationism. Horrible title. I looked at it, and I thought, ugh, you might as well title it Quack Science, Do Not Read Me, you know. But I picked up the book, and I thought, this is going to be great because I'll refute it, and I'll come back to Kurt, and I'll say, this was wrong, and this was stupid, and this was not scientific, and da 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 da, da. And so I had one of those yellow legal pads and pen in hand and back in my apartment, and I started going into this thing, man. Page one, you know, section one, chaos or cosmos. I thought, well, I guess, I guess it is interesting that we live in a cosmos that's organized where matter is organized into stars, stars are organized into galaxies, galaxies into galactic clusters, planets, and it's all swinging around like a giant clock. It's not just a big mass of hydrogen or quarks that are just floating around randomly. It's very organized. How do you get that? And so this actually makes sense. And then chapter two, this, no one told me this. And then chapter three, this makes more sense than anything I've ever heard. And by the time I got to chapter four, my notepad was absolutely blank. I could not find anything wrong with it. And it made more sense of the, the real world. And it didn't, it didn't invoke a single Bible verse. That was important to me. So my first personal discovery was they actually do use circular reasoning. They believe what they want to believe. And then they fill in the blank with what they've already assumed in the first place. And I was doing that very same thing. And it took, it took Kurt, a good friend, to keep pushing me and persist in, in questioning that. Um, and to this day, you can find dozens of news articles that I've written uh, and, and my colleagues have written. We have 50 employees at the Institute for Creation Research. We've been around for over 50 years. We were in San Diego for 36 years. And we've been in Dallas um, forever for the... Do the math of subtraction on that some, for some number of years. And I've been with the Institute for 13 or so years now already. Uh, anyway, who would have thunk that way back then I read this book on creation and now I work for the same organization that produced that very book way back in, in, in the 70s, actually. And I read it in the early 1990s. So, uh, so what happened? So I go back to Genesis. I go back to Kurt's apartment. And I say, you know what, Kurt? You might be right. The fossils might not be millions of years old because I, what are you going to measure? I mean, you can measure length. You can measure isotopes, isotope ratios. Uh, those are versions of atoms. Uh, but you, but you, can't, you can't like measure, what are you going to measure? Agicals to see how, how, what the age is? You just don't measure that. You can measure my hair receding rate you know, I'm getting older, but some guys don't have receding hair, and they're older than me, and those are called bums. <laughs> bums. You can measure wrinkle rate, so those things happen. These are processes that happen, but it happens at different rates for different people, and you just don't know about them. So if you, if you find a candle burning in a room and ask yourself, how long has it been burning, you have to make assumptions about the past in order to make an estimate about how long that candle's been burning. And it's the same with any process you use to measure an age, and you just can't get science to do that kind of job. Science measures that which is repeatable, observable, measurable, and you can't do that to the past. So you have to have a different resource, a different, more appropriate tool to reconstruct the past. Like, like a judge does in a court of law. What kind of tools do judges use? Uh, eyewitness testimony, receipts. So what do we have in the Bible? A collection of reliable historical documents written down by eyewitnesses who were there. Ultimately, God himself, the one who knows it all. So my view of Genesis went up a big tick on the notch of, yeah, that's a joke, to maybe it's more believable, and I read it again and with more respect. 
But then I got to zoology class that very next semester. Zoology is the study of zoos, right? <laughs> no, it's the study of animals. And I had Dr. Fisher as my professor at Stephen F. Austin in the piney woods of East Texas. And he took all of us podunk, piney wood, East Texans. Um, and his mission in life was to persuade us that all the churchy stuff we heard about creation was wrong and all the evolution was right. So he said, this is it, class, this. And he, and he had one of those overhead projectors. And he had a picture of, um, of Archaeopteryx. Will you say that out loud with me? Archaeopteryx? Archaeopteryx. So anyway, that's the name of this extinct fossil bird. And he had an Archaeopteryx, and he slapped the transparency onto the overhead projector. Um, and I'm looking at my audience, and I'm thinking, most of y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Some of y'all don't. That's okay. It looked like this in the end. Uh, and this is a bird with reptilian features that it has retained from its evolutionary past, from when it was evolving from a reptile into a bird. For example, it has teeth in its beak, and it has a long bony tail. Reptiles have long bony tails, and reptiles have teeth in their mouths. So therefore, this must have been evolving from a reptile. Proof of evolution. And I thought, well, if, if that's what it is, that's what it is. It's got to be proof of evolution. And uh, so somewhere, somehow, Genesis is missing something because this is fossil proof of evolution. And if evolution is true, if you can get a reptile to morph into a bird, then you can get creatures to change between kinds. And so whatever it says in Genesis about according to kinds must be wrong. God must be wrong about this. And, uh, and then I got to page, I think it's page 84. I looked it up the other day in that book that Kurt had lent me, the creation book. And guess what's on page 84? Archaeopteryx. And I thought, what are these creationists going to say about Archaeopteryx? They weren't there. They didn't go to Germany to study this fossil firsthand. What do they don't know anything? And then I read it. And you know what? Genius. Brilliant. Didn't have to do their own analysis. They just let the voice of the enemy speak for itself. And they quoted evolutionary experts who had or examined the original fossil. And here's what they had to say about it. And he quoted them. And I read the quotes, and it was something like, based on the fact that he has feathers. See him feathers? <laughs> it left feather impressions. Uh, feathers on the tail, feathers on the wings. Short feathers even on the legs, we, no we, now, uh, we now know. Anyways, uh, it was a bird. And then a second quote that said, even though the transition from reptile to bird is thought of as highly momentous, we don't have a single fossil that we all agree on that verifies that that transition ever took place. And I thought, wait a minute, it's a bird. It's just a dead bird. It's not proof of evolution. And then I thought, also, reptiles aren't the only creatures that have teeth. And then I went to the mirror. <laughs> I'm not a reptile and I have teeth. I mean, some of us might be pretty reptilian, but I don't feel that way most of the time. And then, you know, monkeys have long tails. So is this evolving from a monkey into a bird? That's why it has a long bony tail. So it was totally selective. It was just storytelling. And I went back to Genesis and I thought, wait a minute. If the best example of evolution is just a dead bird created according to its kind that now is extinct, then... Why am I doubting Genesis anymore? And I went back to Genesis and read it again. And I thought, okay, according to kinds, I get it. This was a kind that you created. And, uh, well, then it says created recently. And I'm going to leapfrog two discoveries ahead. But in a minute, I'll tell you more details about this. Recently, the Bible teaches that this happened recently, thousands, not millions of years ago. And just a few years ago, scientists... Um, examined the feather impressions on this uh, fossil from Solnhofen, Germany, and they found keratin protein still remaining in those feathers. And they examined the, 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 um, the limestone uh, where there's not a feather impression, and they found no keratin. So keratin is the same protein. That's what makes up bird feathers today. It also makes a different version of it. It makes up your fingernails and your hair. So anyway, we have a hints that these uh, short-lived proteins, which should be gone after one million years, are still in there. So recently deposited, recently created, and science is aligning with 
what Genesis has been saying all along. I mean, dogs make dogs make dogs. Frogs make frogs make frogs. Nudibranchs make nudibranchs. So, uh, you want to say that, nudibranch? You don't want to say it? You're like, no. <laughs> okay, the common name is sea slug. Say that. I read this article, and, and, and so right about this time, I was going through this retooling of my whole way of thinking about the past. Like, did I come from apes which came from fish? Because that's what I was taught, and that's what I believed. And we'll talk about Adam, not apes, at the end of the day today. But if that happened, then, then, then Genesis can't be right, because it's telling me a completely different story. So who do I believe? God's word in Genesis or my scientists and professors? And if I doubt what my scientists and professors say, then I'm going to be ridiculed. And I don't want that. I don't, I don't want that. <laughs> mm. I want everyone to like me. So that's, that's a deal I was working through. And I got to this library, church library, and it had Creation Magazine. It's still in print. Uh, it's similar to our magazine, but theirs you have to pay for a subscription. Ours is called Acts and Facts, and it's totally free. But um, similar types of encouragements. And I read this article on sea slugs. Well, Dr. Fisher had just explained sea slugs to us. And so you've seen, uh, well, maybe you haven't. Some of you younger people have seen um, Nemo, Finding Nemo. Yeah. yeah. And so you've got this anemone, and then you've got the sea slug. Well, the clownfish swims and doesn't trigger the tentacles stinging cells. So the anemone has stinging cells lining its skin, if you will, on those tentacles. And that's how the anemone captures prey and then eats it, absorbs it. Except the clownfish doesn't trigger those. No one knows how it doesn't. Same with the um, sea slug. Sea slug comes up, and it will, and it will eat one of these tentacles uh, of, of, a, of an anemone. And, and, uh, but not only that. And so, so Dr. Fisher had said, um, anemones evolved first, and then millions of years later, sea slugs evolved independently later on. And so just memorize which creature evolved in what order, and then you'll get an A on the test. So I memorized it and got an A on the test, or some other grade that I won't mention. I got some grade. But this article said, no, nah, not only that, the anemone eats the tentacle, it absorbs, and it absorbs into its gut the, um, all the tentacle tissues, except the stinging cells, somehow it doesn't trip the trigger that other fishes ordinarily would. And it takes that stinging cell that it just ate, and it separates it from all the cells around it, and then it transports it, maybe through some kind of little tubes or something, up into these little finger-like projections that come up from its back. You see them? Those, little, those are blobs, but in, there's different species have different finger-like projections. And it takes those stinging cells that it just stole, and it puts them in, it puts them in place in little, little positions right on its own skin, and it uses the stolen stinging, stolen stinging cells for its own defense. And I thought, Professor Fisher didn't tell me that. Why didn't he say it? And, uh, and I also thought, the only way you can get that is if a designer knows intimately the anatomy and physiology of both the anemone and the sea slug at the same time and crafted them in order to interact so intimately. Only God could do that. And I thought, evolution's out. No more evolution for me. You can't get that with natural processes. You have to have a God, a creator, to, to be able to craft and build something where all the parts fit together so precisely and one part depends on another. So I... So I, that, that article changed my life, and um, I found it, uh, another copy of it, 20 years later, and scanned it. So there you can see what, what that looks like. So that was my, so my, what was my first personal discovery? Well, wait a minute, they're using circular reasoning. So the science behind millions of years, uh, fossils, uh, isn't as scientifically science as I thought it was. And then the second personal discovery was the best example in the fossil of evolution is just a dead bird. So you see, my faith in evolution is starting to suffer. And I'm going back to Genesis and going, wait a minute, 
At every turn here, I'm finding that Genesis got it right again. Genesis got it right about God created the heavens and the earth and everything that is in them, not nature created. And that's what evolution story tells us, is that natural processes do this. Natural processes took a fish and turned it into a person, took hydrogen and turned it into humans, naturally, not supernaturally. And I thought, that can't, that can't be right. It has to be supernatural, uh, just like Genesis said all along. Well, now I'm stuck with, like, how, how, do, I get, um, how do I get these millions of years? I, I, I still struggle with the time, you know, because, boy, once you, once you grow up like I did with the, the belief that, you, that the world is billions of years old, and how, how could it possibly not be the case that all these scientists could be so wrong about such a basic historical element? And so I went back to the Bible, and I thought, how can I squeeze millions of years into this Bible, and I went through these different processes, these different thoughts. One is theistic evolution, which just says um, evolution happened over billions of years, just like the atheistic evolution. Atheistic means what? There is no God. So theistic means there is a God, and that He is outside the created universe that He made, but He can interact in it. That's the theistic God. That's the God of the Bible. Um, and so I just thought, well, you don't get, evolution doesn't work, period. You can call it theistic, atheistic, deistic, you can call it whatever word you want to put before it, but you don't get sea slugs to eat anemones unless you have creation, not evolution. And so I crossed that off the list. And then I remember this next way to squeeze millions of years into the Bible was uh, something called day-age theory. And I was uh, riding in the pickup truck, and a buddy of mine was driving his pickup, and we're driving on the campus, and he's from East Texas, um, and I was talking with him about these issues, and I said, man, I'm really wondering what, how do you get the, you know, the millions of years and the, the, the geologic ages that it seems like these rock layers demand a lot of time, so how do I stick that time into the Bible? And he said, I got it figured out. This is how he drove with his hand on the steering wheel, and I said, do tell. I want to learn. How did you figure this out? And he said, there's a verse in Peter what says, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So them days of creation, they was like a thousand years each or maybe even longer. You can't tell. And so I thought, oh, maybe that's it. Maybe the days of creation don't mean days. So I went back to the Bible, and I found that verse in Peter, and I read the rest of the verse. It says, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So does that mean... <laughs> We take every thousand-year block and turn it into a single day. It's not talking about the days of creation. It's not talking about that at all. All it's saying is God exists outside of time. That's it. He's not bound by time. He's waiting patiently for each of us to come to him. And so praise the Lord for that. So anyway, I, I, and then I went back to the Bible and to Genesis, and it was like, it, was, it could not be more clear that it's talking about regular old days when it says day. It's first day, second day, third day, morning. There was morning and there was evening the third day. And there was morning and there was evening. And then you have Exodus 20, verse 11, which I already quoted. And I bumped into that verse and I thought, oh, how do you squeeze millions of years into this? So that didn't work. And then progressive creation is this really popular theory, especially um, in California for some reason about how you have uh, God made um, an anemones, and then he waited a million years, and then he created the sea slugs, and then he waited a million years, and he created the this. So he gets the credit for creating, but he creates it over millions of years. Um, and of course, to do that, uh, you have to take the Bible to mean something other than what it says. And so what does that mean? If you can't trust what God says plainly, then what kind of God are we dealing with? And this is when it started to get personal for me because I thought, okay, either God is unable to preserve the truth about where I came from in his word and to, and to carry that forward through the generations down to me. If he's unable to do it, then that means he's got something lacking in his ability or power. And who wants to worship a God who's like a little G God? He doesn't deserve my worship. Or maybe he's, he just doesn't care. He's like, yeah, uh, I could have preserved the truth about where you came from in the words of Genesis, but I was, um, I was, uh, I just didn't care, you know. Maybe you can figure it out. Y'all can figure it out on your own. 
Well, who wants to worship a God who's either unable, unwilling, or an uncaring? But now I'm starting to realize, wait a minute, he, he's telling me the truth about where I came from, and he's telling them straightforwardly, and it's because he's able to do that, and he cares enough about me and you to bring this truth down through the generations and deliver it to us uncorrupted in the words of Genesis. And so progressive creation went out, and then gap theory is this idea that you have millions of years squeezed and tucked in between verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1. Um, well, other than the fact that the text has no hint of a gap in it, um, in fact, it's part of one long sentence, uh, Genesis chapter 1. Um, this was inserted so that you can have, you can have um, some sort of an age of the devil where, where you have the rock layers having formed before creation even starts. But of course, if that's the case, then you have... So, so in other words, it's a way to squeeze the geologic ages into the Bible is by sticking them in between verses 1 and 2. It'd be like saying, uh, this morning I woke up and I started to head to uh, Church of the Highlands. Uh, and by the way, I had, I had some donuts that, that Jeff provided and they were pretty good. And then I got ready to come up to the stage and speak. Well, that's what the narrative says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the deep. And then he goes on to describe the, what he does next. So it would be like saying, I got up this morning, and go to, uh, got ready to go to the Church of the Highlands, and, um, and then I waited a million years. And then I had some donuts and the debt provided, and boy, they were, I don't even know if you provided them, but I'm giving you credit. The millions of years aren't in the narrative, but here's the other crime that it commits, and this is more egregious. Um, it sticks death before sin. So in order to get these rocks and the fossils that they contain into the... If those rocks demand millions of years, you've got to stick them in there. But that means that when it says, behold, at the end of chapter 1, God looked at everything he'd made, and behold, it was all very good. Now he's calling billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth good, complete with cancer, thorns, um, bite marks from dinosaurs biting each other and other creatures. It was death mayhem of monsters. <laughs> you know, that's what's recorded in the fossils. And that's all very good? And it happened, it happened before sin? Well, the Bible says, no, it's all very good. And then sin, and then death after sin. In fact, that's the reason Jesus came. So when we insert millions of years of death in between verses 1 and 2... We're sort of undermining the basis for the gospel. And Jesus came to die, suffer the death penalty on our behalf. And so we can have new life because he rose from the grave, defeating death. Uh, and so anyway, gap theory reverses that and says, oh, well, death was around long before, long before sin. That's not true. And so, but here's the, here, so here's what solved it for me is by putting those fossils and the rock layers at the flood. And so we'll talk more about why we need to do that in the next presentation, which is coming up really soon. But let me get to my final uh, personal discovery. And here are some of the, and I told you I was coming here, but here's some evidence. This is what I got a PhD in because I thought I want to know everything I can about this. Um, anyway, so I went through those and I crossed them all off the list. And I ended up landing on Genesis simply got it right. It fits all the data. It fits the data from science, like this. Now, what you're looking at is blood vessels, bone cells, and tissues from dinosaurs, from inside dinosaur bones. And so blood vessels and, and proteins don't last. We know it; they don't last because we can measure them in, in a lab using decay rate studies, uh, which we've replicated at the Institute for creation research. So this looks like it's only thousands of years old, maybe because it is only thousands of years old. You know, <laughs> that's one scientific way to look at it. And so that's how I look at it, is uh, it looks fresh. I mean, I'm getting ready for dinner. That looks pretty decent. I mean, <laughs> that would pass for something that goes into a hot dog anyways. <laughs> and uh, this, we found a hundred different 
journal articles, over 100 now, we're up to 117, I think, as of last week, 118, uh, scientific, technical journal articles that describe these kinds of tissues, blood vessels, bone cells, uh, squishy, flexible material still intact inside um, fossils, all kinds of fossils, fossils, frogs, fish, turtles, uh, dinosaurs, you name it. it. It looks like, and we found it from every continent except uh, Australia. And so, and that's just a matter of time before someone finds more squishy tissue inside fossils from Australia. It's going to happen, I predict, because all the whole world was flooded, and these are flood fossils, flooded thousands, not millions of years ago. That's consistent with these data. We'll talk more about that in the next session. So this was my, my final personal discovery, and I was like, evolution's out, Genesis is in. The timing of Genesis, thousands, not millions of years, that took a long time for me to come around, but once I saw these squishy tissues, I thought, how can I deny this anymore? And then I went back to Genesis, and I thought, wow, more than ever before, I'm convinced and persuaded that God was powerful enough to convey to me exactly where I came from, and he's loving enough. He loves me enough to make sure I knew where I came from. And his very character is embodied in his living word. He loves me. He cares about me and you. And he told us exactly where we came from, and science confirms it.